When your purpose is bigger than you, you have a calling. And losing yourself is when you get a calling. And it's a calling because now it, it's no longer just you. It's, it's more than you. It's bigger than you. In my own little journey, I've had four steps to this, what I would call losing myself with my purpose journey. It started out with I want to make a difference. As a young person, I just wanted to make a difference just like every one of you. Every one of you in this auditorium today, I can promise you if I could come in and sit beside you and you and I could have a conversation, every one of you would say, John, I'd like to make a difference in my life. I'd like to do something that really, really matters. That's how my journey began. I want to make a difference. And then one day I realized I had to go beyond that. There was another step and I went from I want to make a difference to step two. I want to make a difference doing something that makes a difference. This is now I'm going to begin to lose myself. I'm going to begin to lose myself because now I'm focusing on doing something in my life that has eternal value. I'm going to do something in my life that, that is bigger than me, that lives beyond me. That, 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 that can never be satisfied or fulfilled or achieved by me. I want to make a difference doing something that makes a difference. I'm, I'm, now, I'm now beginning to lose myself. And then I went to step three. I want to make a difference doing something that makes a difference with people who make a difference. Because I realized all of a sudden that the big things in life, the great things in life, take a team. One is too small of a number to achieve greatness. And if you're going to do something amazing, it's going to be because you do it with other people. And again, that's what makes this congregation so vibrant. This is what makes this congregation so incredibly relevant today. You're doing it together. You're, you're, you're loving together, praying together, worshiping together, ministering together. You, 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 you're not diving alone. You're diving together. I want to make a difference, doing something that makes a difference, with people that make a difference. And then because I'm my age at 66, because time is important and every day I'm counting my days, I have to count my days. There's a fourth part for me. I want to make a difference, doing something that makes a difference with people that make a difference at a time when it makes a difference. Got to make it count. I don't get many more do-it-overs. Got to make sure that I do it right on the front end. I was, for several years, I go to the Indianapolis 500, Tony George, who owned all that and, and, and was over that race, read all my books. And, and he would have me come in on race day and, and, and talk to the drivers, the owners, and, and, and then we'd go up to his suite and we'd watch the Indianapolis 500. We were having lunch before the race one day and Tony looked at me across the table and he said, John, what's the difference between success and significance? I said, oh, Tony, Success is when I add value to myself. And significance is when I add value to others. And you lose yourself not in success. You find yourself in success. You lose yourself in significance. It's when we begin to add value to others that we begin to lose ourselves because now the cause is greater. Our why, our purpose, our why is bigger than us. And when our why is bigger than us, when you find your why, you'll find your way. Everything changes at that time. I shared with you earlier that I'm 66, so people ask me all the time, they say, John, when are you gonna retire? And I tell them I'm not gonna retire. And they look at me and say, well, why not? You can. Of course I can. I'm old enough to retire. I have enough money to retire. I've, I've been very blessed. I'm very grateful. I mean, I've written 25 million books and sold them. I, that's, just do the math. I'm going to be okay financially. <laughs> well, then, John, John, let me ask you, why, why, don't, you, why don't you retire? I, I, I'm not going to retire because... Because I've lost my way, my, my purpose is greater than me. I, I have a calling, not a career. I, a career you win, a career you kind of phase out. And there's all kinds of things you do with the career, but with the calling, I mean, I, what I do is, is what I love to do and, and I don't want to retire. I don't have any desire to retire. I, I, I didn't come to Birmingham because I wanted another plane trip. I didn't come to Birmingham because I wanted to see Birmingham. I've seen Birmingham. I came to Birmingham because I wanted to see you. 
And I wanted to see you because I thought I had a message perhaps that could help you find your purpose and maybe spark something within you that would begin to get you on your way to, to finding and losing your purpose. That, that's why I came. I'm having the time of my life. I tweeted my wife, Margaret, before I went out. I said, oh, this is what I was born for. I was born for this. And if I was born for this, why would I want to stop? I've decided that I'm going to live until I die. And I've decided I'm not going to get those two confused. Because a lot of people do. So some people say, when are you going to retire? I don't tell you when I'm going to retire. I'm going to retire when I die. When I die, I am retiring. I'm going to make it official. When I'm dead, I am writing no more books. I'm not writing any more books. I kid you not. And when I'm dead, I, 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 I don't care how many times Chris asks me when I'm dead. I'm not coming back. I'm not coming. But I'm going to tell you, until uh, I die, I think I'll live. And I think I'll live because I have a passion for what I do. And I have a purpose for what I do. And I've found my purpose. And I've lost my purpose. And I've lost my purpose in you. Every time you put yourself into someone else, everything changes. I wish my dad were here today. He's still in great health. He's 92. He's amazing. You say, what do you mean he's amazing? He's amazing. He's the greatest man I know. A few years ago, my mother died. They'd been married for 66 years. When she died, even though he was in good health, my brother and sister and I, we said, Dad, let's get, us, let's get you in a kind of retirement community it, so that you have support around you, people around you. And they were just building one close to his home, and so he said, okay. And so we took him over and got him all ready in the whole process. And, and one day I was having lunch with him. He said, son, he said, you know that when, when, they, when they opened the retirement community, they've said I could be the first one to move in. I said, Dad, that's great. I said, uh, why do you want to be the first one to move in? Well, he said, son, there's a bunch of old people going to come here. <laughs> and he said, those old people, he said, they're nervous and they're insecure and they've never been away from home. And he said, they need somebody here to encourage them. And he said, I want to be the first one. I want to be right at the front door. So when they come into the, into the community, I can shake their hand and say, my name's Melvin Maxwell. I just want you to know I'm your friend and it's going to be okay. And we're going to have a good time here. He said, they need somebody to help them. That's what he did. And that's what he does. That's what he's doing. In fact, while I'm teaching here, he's become the chaplain of that place. They didn't vote him in, he just raised his hand and elected himself. <laughs> Found a nice big empty kind of hall there and meeting room in the their facility and asked him if he could have church there and so he had a first service and he filled it up and so he got a second service and he's got it full now recently we we're having lunch he said son he said we're full he said I, I we've got a real problem we've got a real challenge he said we're full in the first service we're full in the second service he said I'm looking into satellite now I'm, I'm looking into <laughs> I, I, I'm looking into satellite He's 92, and he's looking into satellite. He's 92. He's looking into satellite. He's found his purpose. He's lost in his purpose. It's absolutely incredible. I have a coaching company. <laughs> and we had met several hundred of our coaches to, for training a, a, a few weeks ago, and I was having dinner with him. Before I went over to Orlando for the coaching conference, I said, Dad, on, on, on Sunday, I'm going to speak. And I said, would you mind coming over and speaking a little bit? And he said, well, son, he said, I'd love to come over and speak to those coaches. He said, they need some encouragement. But he said, you know, I've got two services. <laughs> I said, with that, I said, I'll tell you what, I'll get the limo driver to pick you up and we'll have an early one. We'll, we'll have you speak at 8 o'clock and you can be done at 8.30 and you can get back because your first service is at 9 and your next service is at 11. He said, oh, he said, that'll be wonderful. And he said, he looked at Betty as he just got him a brand new kind of wife and boy, he's just so happy with her and she take care. She's an 82-year-old chick, okay? And, and, and he's so happy with her and he says, oh, honey, he said, it's going to be wonderful. He says, I'll get to do three services on Sunday. He's 92. He's 92. He's found his purpose that's what I want for you your books have shaped my philosophies about leadership they validated things I hoped were true about being a leader and I've just learned so much from you so I know everybody's gonna do that today but I want to know a little about you because I don't know the whole background so obviously you were a pastor of a church prior to getting into this space Skyline Church yes right? in uh, San Diego California. I was a pastor for 25 years 
Everybody, they're 25 years yeah. pastor. This particular church we were talking, by the way, before the interview, three pastors in, in 70 years. Is that not incredible? Yeah, That's yeah. a great church. And I followed, I was the second one, I followed the founding pastor and loved it and, and lo because I love to help people. Yeah. But I was with my publisher at a meeting and uh, they said something that just uh, changed my life. They said, John, we've been looking at the people who buy your books. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and two-thirds of your books are bought by the business community. Mm -hmm. and, and I was totally shocked at I, I honestly mm -hmm. had no clue. Because I, I was really, as a pastor, kind of writing more to the church community and, and the religious sure. community. And, and, uh, and I said, you're kidding me. They said, no. They said, you become very popular in the business community because your leadership principles cross right over. And so the business people are going in there and they're grabbing your books to get the principles out so they can lead better. Mm. And, and literally, but now I'm a person of faith. Yes. So at that moment, Ed, I really felt God just say to me, and this is where you're going to spend the rest of your wow. life, wow. in the business community. Mm. And, uh, and so I, I made, literally that day, made preparations to resign my congregation. We were in a major building program, so it took me a couple of years to do it correctly and sure. make sure that, uh, that, that they would have success after I left. But, but literally, uh, that was the day that kind of changed me and had me, I, I went over to this entirely new area. That's interesting. So, so there's a calling on your heart, right? Definitely. And it's, there are people that are listening to this, because I get messages from them all the time, that are in something similar, meaning they're, they're in a career that maybe was their first dream. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. this was their dream. They thought this is what they wanted yeah. to do. They've gone down the road to a certain extent, but they're feeling this tug on their heart to maybe chase their their passion or yeah. their mission. What would you say to those people? That had to be a difficult decision. You had all these people relying on you. Oh, of course. You know? Well, first of all, if you're very successful, whatever you leave, you're leaving something that's very successful. And, sure. and what I found a long time ago, it's very easy to leave something that's bad. You know? <laughs> right. It's kind of like, right. get out of yeah, town, thank you know you. what I mean? Right, Where's right. the exit? Right. It's, but, but when it comes to something successful, you know, people say, wow, do you, I mean, I've got to give this up. I mean, this yeah. is really good for me. This is, this is really working. In fact, I tell people all the time they need to do an autopsy on success hmm. because, because the greatest detriment of tomorrow's success is today's success. Because I, uh, the tendency is for me when I'm successful, Ed, to, to hold on to it and say, yes. okay, okay, let's not change anything. We've got the formula. We got it down. We're making some good money. We're helping some people. So let's, let's, you know, let's kind of box it and kind of mm. set it apart and, and let's keep it just as it is. And of course, that's a disaster. In fact, that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book, Leaderships, mm. is because I, I wanted to help. I wanted to help people understand that that there's no such thing as leading people the same way forever. That you have to keep learning and growing and and and, and shifting and, and mm. making those shifts in, in your life, mm. but uh, for me, when I made this transition into the uh, into the business world, uh, what I discovered was, as you were talking a moment ago, the you know you feel the tug on your heart, the, yeah. the kind of like, wow, I started here and and now I'm over here. Here's what I believe: I believe that as you follow your dream, it begins, it gets bigger. Mm. And, and when it gets bigger, there are, there are more things that you're learning about it that you didn't know when you started. The, in the beginning, the dream is just, you know, it's just very little and, yeah. and you can kind of see it. And yeah. So you go that way, but then it begins, then it begins to expand. Yes. And, and, and for me, it's a calling. And let me just say this. Yeah. Um, I'm not trying to be over spiritual, but somebody asked me the other day what a calling was. And I, I like kind of my new definition for calling. Okay. okay? In fact, in my, um, in my book, Leaderships, I, one of my chapters is shifting from career to calling, and, and, and how you know how you know perfect. You know, and how do I how do I make that shift? But I think I think a calling is a uh, is a purpose with a divine touch. Oh, that's wonderful! <laughs> you know, I love that. Isn't that good? <laughs> yeah, I'm not telling you that, right? That sounds terrible, but it, it is good. I'm still it. Is it. Good. It's still it is good. good. But it, it's 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 you've got this purpose, but yeah. there's a difference thing, and that, that there's a higher touch. Uh, right. I, I was doing an interview on we in our John Maxwell company. We have a Simon cast called L2L that goes out yeah. to hundreds of sites, and Tyler Perry and I were doing an interview together, and he wrote a book, and I love the title of his book, and that is Higher Is Waiting. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I, lo I love that. And, and I think that a calling is, is you've got this purpose, but all of a sudden, higher is waiting. There's a mm. divine touch on it until all of a sudden you say, okay, that's, this is more than just my purpose. Mm. This is our purpose, our purpose, God's purpose, and my purpose that's together. Beautiful. And you talk, you want to talk about a partnership? That's a good partnership. That's man. the ultimate partnership. That's the ultimate yeah. partnership. Oh, really I, I love that. Yeah. See, I already okay. I'm done. I already, that's what I need. <laughs> Did you grow up? I'm just curious. We're gonna just navigate in and out of different topics. Did you grow up in your faith? 
Was that something you were raised with in your household? Yeah, yeah. My 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 father was a pastor. Your dad was a pastor. So too. yeah, okay. I grew up in a beautiful home. In fact, my father's still alive. Okay. He'll be uh, in just in fact a couple of days. He'll be ninety seven. That's incredible. And and um, that bodes well for you. By the yeah, way. it really does. It bodes really <laughs> really, really well for me. And, and but I I was very fortunate. You know, I, mm. when it comes to parents, I won the lottery. I just, mm. you know, many people, you know, we don't choose our parents, right. but my parents, um, my mother unconditionally loved me mm. and my father had this, and still has this incredible drive and so, entrepreneurship and mm. this, this uh, kind of largeness about him that mm. uh, constantly expands his world. So as his world was expanding, we were growing up in it and my world expanded. Yeah. And so I grew up in a leadership culture. Sure. I didn't even know what it was as a kid. But, it was your but, environment. Yeah, it, yeah. it was just it's it's what, what it is. It's what is. Hey, well, I, I do want to get started, John, because uh, this idea of 200, it's it's got a little special place in our history, right? It's um, it this this idea of two hundred really starts for the United States, but in the United States, the year or the the day July fourth means a good bit for us. Sure does. July fourth, nineteen seventy six or seventeen seventy six means a little bit more to us, right? I mean, that's that's where our nation declared itself solvent and. Uh, and we declared our independence. That's right. It began then. 200 years after that, on July 4th, 17, uh, 1976, something significant. Yeah. Yeah, don't make me any older. <laughs> don't, than make you don't, 17... don't make me any older. Let, let's say, keep it with 1976. <laughs> yes. Okay? To July 4th, 1976, <laughs> something really unique happened to us that literally changed the trajectory of all of our lives. Take us back to that day in July of 1976. Well, I'll be glad to, Mark. You, I was a I was a pastor in Lancaster, Ohio. Church was really growing, and uh, we had a Fourth of July parade, and our whole congregation uh, for the town of Lancaster, it's only a town of thirty thousand people. Uh, we literally had floats and the whole deal for the for the city, and it ended up in our ch on our church property, and we had an outdoor service because there were about five thousand people. I couldn't obviously handle the crowd in the in the uh, building. So we had an outdoor service that day on July 4th, 200th birth, uh, anniversary of America. And I'm just uh, uh, preaching a message. And in the middle of the message, I very clearly sensed that God spoke to me, Mark, and, and said, uh, you'll spend the rest of your life training leaders. Now, honestly, this had never been a thought of mine. I mean, I loved leadership, but I had never thought about it. In fact, on the way home, I shared with Margaret, I said, I, I think God talked to me. <laughs> That doesn't happen very often. And, and she said, well, what do you think he said? I said, I, I think that I'm, I'm to train leaders. And, and she said, well, what are you going to do about that? I said, nothing. Really, if God called me to do that, I think I'll let him open the doors. That week, literally two uh, different conferences called me and asked if I would come. And they specifically asked if I would teach them how to do leadership. And I said, I would be glad to. And I responded to those two invitations, and uh, the invitations never stopped, Mark. I mean, they never stopped. It, I just, I fell naturally into becoming a leadership teacher, coach, speaker, writer. It was just what I was born for, and I knew it, and everybody around me seemed to know it. And so, it, but it took off on the 200th anniversary of America, and of course, we're on our 200th podcast, but, but. Uh, that was quite a while ago, and and look where we are today. Yeah. I, and and again, I would have never fathomed, never would I have fathomed that that little, that moment, that calling, would have led us to where we are today. I, I mean, that's way beyond us. But I would just say to all of the viewers and listeners of the podcast today, just don't despise small things. I mean, I I think it's obedience to something that is uh, maybe not hugely significant that leads the pathway to great things later on in life. We're, we're right at, I mean, that's, um, let me do my quick math here. That was seven, 1976, 30, 40. We're 45, almost 46 years yeah. into that almost. decision. And I don't think you've ever wavered from that moment in 1976. Can you, can you talk to us a little bit about what you're experiencing because of consistently staying true to that calling, yeah. the consistency yeah. idea? Well, I haven't wavered. I, I, I never have. I, it's, I've never had a day or an hour in my life where I thought I ought to be doing something besides leadership. 
And, you know, I think about that. We're going to talk about consistency compounds, maybe markets, because I had nothing else I could do. You know what I mean? It's, <laughs> yeah. it's kind of like if you can only do one thing, you're not going to waver. You're going to stay there. I just said, okay, uh, doors are open and I'll teach leadership. I started teaching leadership. The demand increased that, you know, then someday I've got to write a book about leadership. And then I developed resources for leadership. And, oh, I better get a company started because somebody's got to handle these resources that people are, are wanting. And in fact, all of the John Maxwell Enterprise really was based out of a vision and a calling to, to train leaders. And we really didn't even try to start companies. We just had to have companies to facilitate what the demand was and, and what the needs were. And so, yes, all these years, almost, almost half a century, we're still doing leadership. And by the way, I'm more convinced today that everything rises and falls on leadership than I was 50 years ago when I first thought that that incredible thought. I so I, I think it's something to I think it's something to give your life t- to one thing. And when you get on this side, look back and say the one thing I gave my life to was worth every bit of my energy. And by the way, it seems more important to me today than when I started. It, it never faded, it never kind of got lost. It it's just always been right there clear and uh we've been Faithful. And then, of course, then for me to see you pick up this baton, take and carry this mantle, and I know that this message of leadership is going to continue on for uh, decades now. It, that's even it, that's even more rewarding, honestly, because it's one thing to start something, but it's some, something entirely different to see somebody take your legacy and and you realize that it is so important that people won't let it down. Yeah, they'll they'll yeah. still carry that ball. You know, it's funny because. I know the story, and we probably even told a little bit to our podcast family, but this idea that to impact people you'll never meet, I need to do something different. We're going to talk about that in the context of the podcast in just a little bit, but let's talk about it in the context of books. Yes. Okay, so just some fun facts for you, John. Uh, Since we started our podcast, now get this, 200th episode, August of 2018, some of you joined us to become our first ever podcast family. And for those of you that have been to every episode and experienced everything, you've made this what it is today. Sure. So, thank so thank you, you to that. Yeah. We're we're now as as our podcast, uh, we're now over 19 million downloads. It's a lot of people. 160 thousand a week is downloading a podcast and listening to it, and. Uh, John, it kind of all really started for you, this idea of impacting others that you you never impacted with books. Yes, it did. 86 books. Listen to this. 86 books, 119 derivatives of those books. So we have 119 ISBN. So if you say you've read everything John's done, yeah. you need to have 119 uh-huh. ISBNs books on your shelf. Yeah, but John, don't, don't worry about that. I don't have that many <laughs> on mine, so don't worry about it. <laughs> but, but John... Just since we started the podcast, holistically, you have sold over 4.3 million books. 4.3 million new hands have shared with your book. Now, just because the podcast, we have seen 190,277 come to our podcast website to get one of your books. Now, here's what that means. 139 books a day. Every 10 minutes, somebody's coming and grabbing your book because of this podcast. And uh, on this podcast, it'll probably be every minute. You know I mean? <laughs> it's, right. it's probably even going to increase it more. So <laughs> it that's is. amazing. I, you know, I never even think of those things. You do. You, you run the ship, not me. But that's a lot of books. And you know what's so interesting, Mark, is when I started, my mentor, Les Parrott, wrote books. He had written five books. And one day at lunch, I asked him, I said, why do you, you, know, why do you write books? I had no desire to write a book. I, had, I loved reading, but I had no desire to write a book. And I asked him, and he said, John, I write books to influence people beyond my personal touch or reach. And when he said that to me, I leaned, I mean, I leaned right into said, I'm gonna write books. My whole motivation was to increase my influence and the things I thought and believed beyond my human reach. And so when you start reading those stats and, you know, I don't know, 35, 36 million people have bought my books, honestly. Again, at that table, I, you know, I just thought maybe my mother and my aunt and my two cousins would buy my books. I had no idea. 
And I think that's one of the things I really want people to see. I tell people all the time, I wish they could have seen me in the beginning. Because, you know, beginnings don't start great. You know, you don't start beginnings with great success and fanfare. You just you just start. And you you don't help a million people. You hope to help a hundred people. Yeah. And but if you can't help a hundred people and be faithful with that. You're never going to get a million people to help. And and I just wish that I wish that everyone wherever you are on your journey would be very fulfilled right now. People ask me all the time, I say, Well, but you know, 75 and all this stuff happening to you, but you're incredibly fulfilled. I say I am. But honestly, I was as fulfilled when I was in my first church with just a, you know, 30, 40 people there in a little country church. I I was as fulfilled then as I am now. And I think the key is. Fulfillment isn't how much I have. Fulfillment is me doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Wow. And I think I think if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, then what can be better than that? Yeah. And, and so all this other stuff, it, honestly, I'm grateful, but it is stuff. And, it, you know, it keeps coming, and we're, we're, we're grateful for that. But, but I was grateful when I didn't sell any books, and I was, I was just grateful to— Teach, a, you know, my first lead. My first leadership co- conference had seventeen people attend it. It was in Kansas City, at the airport in Kansas City, Missouri. Seventeen people came, and the people that were handling the little conference for me told me that John, you may want to cancel the conference because you're going to lose three thousand dollars if you go because you don't have, get enough registrations to pay for all the expenses. And I, I, I looked at him and I said, Oh no, no, we'll go. They said, well, you're going to lose $3,000, I said, but I'm going to help 17 people. And it never entered my mind not to go to Kansas City and help. But yes, I lost 3,000 people, or $3,000, and I helped 17 people. But you have to start somewhere. Yeah. And you just start. And by the way, if you're good, it'll increase. And by the way, if you're not really good, it probably won't increase. <laughs> go from and, 17 sorry. people down to two. Oops. You and your significant other. Yeah, yeah. That's what you may want to say. Maybe this is, isn't my calling or gift. You uh, know, I get asked a lot, John, and it's so funny when I get asked this question, what's the favorite thing about you and traveling the world with you and getting to start businesses with you? Or what's the thing you've learned the most from John? And I, and I always pause because I never want to miss the daily experience of learning something from you. Mm-hmm. But I have to tell you, that whether it was 52, 53 when I joined your team or whether it's now 75, what I love about you is your passion to constantly be growing, yes. constantly be challenging yourself. And so, John, one of those was the podcast. Seriously, when we started this podcast, John doesn't do a lot with technology. He, we laugh about that often. But you said, hey, Mark, just like the book with Les Parrott, you said, Mark, if this is a way to impact people, then I'm in. Yeah, but, but Mark's been nice to me. First of all, Mark had to explain to me what a podcast was. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so let's start. Let's start with the basics. So, oh, that's what a podcast is. And then he said, "Hey, I think we could help some people." And of course, now you can c- tell the rest of the story. But I didn't even know what a podcast was. But that's okay. Relax. But it's okay. And listen, let me tell you why. Too many leaders, and there's a teaching point here, and I'm gonna let you teach on challenging yourself to constantly grow in a minute. But too many leaders, if they don't understand it, they won't do it. That's not you. If you understand that there is something on the other side that will allow you to look at people in this camera and add value to them, you're all in. You don't resist because of a lack of awareness or competence. And so, John, this is a stat for you, okay? Because I I brought some stats today. That's here. In the month of uh, of November, uh, excuse me, of February of 2022, we had 165,000 downloads a week. What that means is, John, every four seconds of the month of February, somebody was downloading an episode of our podcast and listening to it around the world. That's so great. And so I I, want to thank you on behalf of all these people watching, all these people listening. I want to thank you for saying yes to the podcast because you didn't have to. We couldn't have done it without you. What is it in you that challenges you to grow yourself every single day, every single month? Every single well, year. first, let me take a leadership lesson here from what you just said, Mark, because I didn't understand podcasts. And when they said, we think that if we did a podcast, we could help a lot more people. Well, I'm all in because the phrase is, we can help a lot more people. I think what I want maybe to just teach on for just 30 seconds is very simple. 
I think there's a big misunderstanding of the fact that the leadership should know the leaders should know everything. I, I don't there are a lot of things I don't know. The podcast, I don't know. I mean, I would have never on my own started a podcast. If if you don't know what it is, you wouldn't start it. But I think that I wish all of all of you part of this podcast would, would understand you really have to have good people around you and then you have to let them lead you. You have to let them speak into your life. You have to let them come and share their thoughts and ideas. And, and, and so a lot of times as a leader, I don't lead, I follow. And I, you know, I follow Mark. I say, okay, Mark, let's, let's do the podcast. You get it ready and tell me how I can help you and how I can serve you. But I think that, um, I think of all the things I wouldn't have today if I wouldn't have listened to my team around me yeah. and, and, and said, I think that's a good idea. And I tell people all the time, the, the best idea is the idea that should always win. And, and, you know, I may have founded some companies, but when I get in with my group and I throw out an idea, I expect everybody to make it better and improve it. And I don't walk out of the room saying, well, you know what? It, they didn't take my idea. We, we want to have the best for the people. If you want the best for the people, you want to get the best people around you. So, Mark, we have a whole team of wonderful leaders and people in our whole John Maxwell enterprise. And so much of what they think about and their ideas and, and, and their initiative and their programs is really what's making us great today. It's, it's not like one person's really brilliant and they got a whole bunch of people following around saying, what's next, Daddy? It, it, it's no. No, you think of another way we can add value to people, and when it's good, we're gonna we're gonna take it too, and we'll give you the credit. And so I just love the fact that we have so many wonderful people doing so many wonderful things that have made me so much better. I would never be who I am today if it wouldn't be for all those people. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, you you say often that content is king. Yeah. We're, we're in a world that content, and what I what I love, John. Another thing that I love about you is. Not only do you never stop growing, you never stop thinking. You you are a thought leader. And so I heard you say the other day, this has been since your 75th birthday, which, by the way, on behalf of our podcast community, happy birthday. Yeah, thank you. I heard you say the other day, you got, I don't know it, you got a, you got 10 more books in you. Oh, I do, yeah. And so you've been yeah. talking about a couple of things lately um, that I'd love for you to just give our podcast family a glimpse into. One of those is Return on Failure. Well, yeah. Give us this idea that you're working on with Return on Well, Fire. really, again, the idea came from you and I having a conversation from one of our John Maxwell coaches. Yeah. Um, and, and you were talking about, about how, how do you get a return on failure? And when I, as soon as I heard you say that, Mark, I thought, man, I have never talked about how to get a return on failure. So I started thinking, reading, doing what I do, creating. And so I developed this teaching on how to have a return on failure. And the first time I gave it, the people went crazy. They, yeah. I mean, it was kind of like, I mean, we talk about return on investments. We talk about return on time, but nobody ever talks about return on failure. And I gave them, I think, I don't know, six or seven ways to get a return on failure. And it worked. And it worked so well that I said to myself, this needs to be a book. And by the way, a lot of my books are birthed out of my speaking. Yeah. And, and, you know, the audience, the audience will tell you if it's any good or not. You know, if they're all going to the restroom, you know, probably don't want to write a book on that. And, <laughs> and, and, and so I, I, I spoke on it and it had such a good response. So now I'm working it and it, 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 it'll be a book. And I think I just see it give people such encouragement and hope that they can get a return on failure. And, and my, just, I'll, I'll, I can't tell you the whole thing, but the kind of the thesis is this. What would you attempt to do in your life? If you knew you would fail, but you would get a positive return out of it. Think of all the things that we would do. I, I, it, it's just, I could fail here, but if I do fail, I'm going to get a positive return on it. So that's what that lecture book is all about. We really do want to add value to you. I love Tracy. I said this in the, the intro. Uh, I love watching you lead. I love watching you. You're incredible at stay on the stage. You're incredible behind the scenes as a thinker. You're incredible as a mom. You're incredible as a woman that knows how to lead. You've got all these different forces that most people have allowed to opt them out of good leadership. And I would come and say, and I know we want to talk about leadership at a at a application level. But how do you stay grounded? 
Oh, that is so nice. Uh, thank you so much. I think it really comes down to the comment that he made at the very beginning, and that was understanding your place. That really, and I, I hope that we can settle on that a little bit and talk about that a little bit, and I would love to hear your thoughts. But when he talked about understanding your place and understanding how that how that aligns with who God is in my life, um, and and then how that is and how I interact with other people, that really truly is my anchor and and my grounding. So that understanding who I am in light of God and how I move throughout the world in any place I show up, that really and again that sounds a little mystical. Hopefully we're going to get into it a little bit more. But thank you for saying that. I think that truly is my grounding root. You know, uh, this podcast, I say it every single week, this is about adding value to you, podcast listener, podcast viewer, so that you can multiply value to others. But here I go violating that statement by saying, I just want everybody to tone out for a minute because Tracy just spoke to me. Because I'm going to tell you, gang, what, what she just said and how she highlighted what John said, which is... Being grounded as a leader is all about being settled in your calling and your purpose to lead. And I, in full disclosure, now my whole mind, this whole podcast is going to be on what Tracy just said. Because for 13 years, I was grounded as John Maxwell's second man. I was grounded in that. Unshakable confidence and unshakable settledness. It's withstood the, the most challenging times. I now have a new dimension called ownership of leading. And I'm just listening to this going, Mark Cole, you need to go back and listen. This. I'm in the middle of the podcast. I need to already go back and listen to it, Tracy, to go, dude, I, I really think I just got something that has been elusive to me for three years that I've got to go figure out. So thank you, podcast family, for listening. See you later. See you next time. I'm just kidding. Wrap. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Tracy. That really is powerful what you just said. Being grounded as a leader starts with being settled in your leadership. And uh, I'm I'm gonna go I'm gonna go work on that. Well, I I think what he said was so powerful. If you're going to go high in life, it's going to be be because you are thoroughly grounded. And I think that doesn't matter whether you're in your 50s like us, or you could be a teenager listening to this, no matter where you are in your leadership journey, just starting out or decades in, we can hear that with fresh, with a fresh insight and analyze ourselves up to that statement to say, have I been whipped around by life's, you know, storms that have been hitting me? And maybe it's because my roots are, have been shallow. And maybe I need to grow some really deep roots to identify who I really am. Because John says, we see other people not as they are, but as we are. So in our leadership journey, it might be just because of how we're viewing ourselves and really anchoring ourselves. So with that, we're off and running. We're <laughs> off and running. But what I love about when he said, understanding your place, I feel like that was a, could be for some, a triggering comment. But for me, it really was a it was a grounding statement because I believe that so many people get off track with understanding their place in this world and in their leadership. And John will often quote Don Shula, coach Don Shula, football player, by saying it's the start that stops most people. And I think a lot of people, when they envision themselves as a leader, and I'm going to talk to you young leaders here for just a little bit. Maybe when you're starting out, I just had a conversation with my son, Bradley, he's 18. He is a senior in high school. I know that your Macy is a senior in high school. And, and he had a word spoken over him. He went away for a church retreat and he came back and had a word spoken over him that he's a leader. And he came back and he said to me, mom, I'm not like a typical leader because he's introverted. And he said, I'm, I'm quiet, I'm not loud. My leadership is more introverted, it's more quiet. And I just said to him, I think you're in, I think you're, you're, uh, what you're thinking of as a leader is off track. I think you're thinking of a leader as loud and boisterous, and that's not lo what leadership is. Remember what John says, leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. And influence can be quiet and steady. And so when John says, 
you know, if you're going to go high, you need to be thoroughly grounded. I think young leaders and maybe older leaders want to a higher place. They want to be higher than when they where they are. They want to be higher than others, maybe bigger than others, louder than others. Talk about, Mark, the conversations, maybe behind the curtain conversations you've had with John and maybe with yourself to those young leaders or maybe older leaders in their 40s, 30s, 40s, 50s like us who had a wrong vision about leadership. If they want to go high, they thought they had to be higher than others rather than grounding themselves in some humility that John talked about. What are some things that John has talked to you about humility or things that you say to yourself to really ground yourself in humility, not to go higher than others, but come to come alongside of them and walk slowly through the crowd with them. I think um, the way I say it, and it, it won't be new to our podcast regular listeners, is you have to be bigger on the inside than the outside. There has to be this grounding. It's why you, you quoted John, but he finished his teaching today with this statement, you can only go high if you have a good foundation. That's bigger on the inside than the outside. That's this, this concept that you can have a perspective of leadership. And what I've found is leadership, like you told your son, leadership is not about your personality, about your disposition. It's not. Those things accelerate your effectiveness as leaders, no doubt. We see a lot of leaders that are that have the woo, they have the charisma. We absolutely see that. But some of the best leaders are leaders that um, their voice has very rarely been heard. And I think it comes then about something much bigger than that. And that is how settled, we started the whole conversation talking about that. How strong are you on the inside so that you can lead effectively for the longest period of time on the outside? You know, I tell the story about when I was five years old, I loved to tell people what to do. I loved it. I really did. I loved Same. as a, as the baby of five, I loved telling people what to do, and I loved it even more when they would listen. Well, that's a five-year-old demonstration of wanting to use his voice to move people, to influence people. I didn't know that. I didn't know that as a five-year-old. I didn't know it as a 10-year-old, 15-year-old. It was 18 years old. I read the book, Developing the Leader Within You, and I went, oh, I like leadership. I want to be a leader. And then I went through life circumstances, as we've all talked about many times on the podcast. And then I come into John's organization saying, I want nothing to do with leadership. Thank you very much. Made two vows, Tracy. I don't want to lead ever again. I don't want to lead people. I lost my one chance to do that. And I don't want a significant relationship again. I don't, have, I don't, I don't qualify for those anymore. And I swore those two things off in this environment. I actually just uncovered the gift that was in me that still needed to be let out, and that is to lead. But leadership can take different manifestations, different expressions, and then we get off track with our leader again. And so to your son, to me, to everyone listening, you do have to be settled in what your leadership should look like and make sure that comes from a source within and not affirmation without. You must be a bigger leader on the inside. In other words, how do you want people to respect you? You need to respect yourself more in that area, and you need to do whatever it takes to become respectable to yourself in that area. Is it in decision-making? Is it in communication? Is it in running multi-million dollar companies? Whatever it is, you got to be bigger on the inside in that belief than the outside. Because if you source your certainty externally, there's way too many factors that will cause you to be shaky somewhere down the road. Source your certainty on the inside on the type of leader and the function or the expression of that leadership. And when you do that, you will have this calmness that we, we so adore in John Maxwell. Mm hmm. So good. That was for you, Bradley, because I'm certainly going to have him listen. Thank you for speaking <laughs> to my son, but also to those of you who are parents of budding leaders who you know your child is a leader, whether they are in high school or college or just it coming out into their career or into their calling or you're that person yourself. I hope you are listening to this and sharing this episode 
with someone who needs to hear this because I know that they need to hear this. Okay, so number two was authenticity, and that was a great one. I want to get to number three because our time is short, uh, but I do want to just highlight the fact that list, I hope you print out our bonus resource because John gives the list of fans and friends. In today's language, that might be followers and friends uh, with social media, but gosh, if you just look, Print it out. Sometimes for those of you who are visual, if you see the difference between the list of fans and friends or followers and friends, social media sets us up and encourages the gap, encourages the gap for us to have fans or followers rather than friends and take it from our mentor, John Maxwell, to go for the list of friends uh, rather than fans and followers. So I just wanted to highlight that for those of you who are listening. <laughs> so number three, he talks about something so powerful that I think was maybe for some of our listeners is going to be a little bit of a mind mind blow. Um, if you're bigger than your purpose, that's a career. If your purpose is bigger than you, that is a calling. So I'm curious, Mark, what would you tell us is your calling? Because John shares us what his calling is to add value to leaders who multiply apply value to others. What is Mark Cole's calling? And then the second follow-up question to that, once you share that with us, is were, did, were you ever pursuing a career that turned into a calling or were you somebody, because I can't help but think our listeners might be listening and thinking, oh shoot, I'm, I'm in a career. What if, I don't, what if I'm not in a calling? Uh, did you pursue a career that turned into a calling and it, it, or you stumbled upon it or were you always pursuing a calling? Yeah. So first, let me say this about calling, because um, you guys know it's this. A confusing, but, maybe. Yeah. John said this on the um, on the podcast that often people mystify the idea of a calling. And uh, let me just kind of, again, debunk that for just a moment. John and I have a um, strong persuasion to our leadership lens that's founded in our faith. And so many of you know that. Many of you feel the same way as we do, but yet you wasn't pastor's kids like John and I who heard this stuff all the time. So I grew up calling, calling, calling. What's your calling, calling, calling? I never heard somebody say, what's your purpose? What's your purpose? What were you here for? We Because we framed it in calling. And so first let me demystify the fact that when John says calling, have a purpose bigger than you, he really says this, every one of us was designed to be bigger for the world than what the world is for us. In other words, leave more in the world when you leave than you take while you're here. There's something in each one of us, we believe this, for, for our faith people, we believe it's placed in, in us by God. For those of you that have a different kind of persuasion, it's, it's, it's your sense of purpose on the earth. Why do you want to leave the earth better than when you take it? Every one of us have a desire, a purpose, a calling to be about something bigger than ourselves. It's in us. So now that I've kind of framed that, let me let me come back and I, I'm going to keep using the word calling because that's what John did. John used in the in the lesson, but just kind of demystify it for me, all of you podcast listeners. It's kind of your purpose. It's your sense of contributing more than you take. And for me, Tracy, coming back, I I knew my life purpose. At 33, I was designed to motivate and inspire people to reach their full potential. I was designed, I was placed here on earth to help people reach their full potential, to motivate them, inspire them to reach that potential. That was a gift to me, but I can't, that purpose statement, Tracy, went back and, and made sense of everything that had happened in my life. It gave a proper perspective to the places where I had misstepped and got, a, got away from my center. It, it gave me clarity for the things that I had done well and went, ah, oh, that's why that felt so fulfilling. And it gave meaning to the lessons that I learned when at 33, I found my purpose statement. So I, I, it was always in me. But see, I, at 30, I was given the opportunity to have a crystallized calling. 
that was in proximity to John. But it wasn't until literally, let's see, this would have been 13 years ago. So at 40, at 40, I was able to tell you that I was placed here on earth to be available and approximate to John so that the influence of this brand will forever continue growing and impacting others. So when it was chan- when it was time to start a podcast, I went, absolutely. It's going to let me use my experience and my influence to impact literally now 40 million people, 40 million downloads. It was an easy decision. I didn't do it because there was going to be 40 million downloads. I would have done it if there would have been two downloads because it was an ability to have an expression of what I've been given, John Maxwell's influence in my life to motivate and inspire others. See, when we mystify calling and we wait for some buzzword rather than chasing the things that fulfill us that actually benefits others, not chasing the things that fulfill us that benefits ourselves, that's a drive, that's a sense of accomplishment. A sense of significance is when we do things that fulfill us that benefit others. And I can, I can honestly say I'm very clear on my calling. My calling is a guide to me that makes sense of the past, gives clarity to the future, and gives hope for the, I'm sorry, gives pre- clarity to the present and gives hope to the future. That's because living in my calling will allow me to finish my life leaving it all on the field and making a difference for others. What did you say about the something to the past? I'm writing that down yeah. in case they didn't my, catch it. My, to- my calling, my life purpose, it actually makes sense of the past. It gives clarity on the things that I made a mistake on, a blunder on. It gives clarity to the present and it gives hope to the future. So it makes sense of the past, clarity to the present, and hope to the future. That is so good. Okay, so we are we are at our, our, our time limit, but I just wanted to wrap up. So if somebody is listening to us and they are discovering that they're maybe in their career and they might be a little bit disappointed, one time I just wanted to share with you all, I spoke with John and I said, you know, what if somebody is feeling like they don't maybe have something that Mark just described or that John described where they don't feel like they have found a, a calling yet or something where they feel like they're designed for something that feels bigger than them yet. And I just wanted to share one time uh, what I, what John shared with me. And that was, he said, and maybe you can expand on this, Mark. He just said, well, then continue to do what, you know, creating your career, continue to pursue your career and maybe find someone else who has found their calling and and come alongside of them and be a part of that, maybe alongside of your career. So someone who you get excited about what they're doing. And that's maybe what we're doing here through Maxwell Leadership, being a part of the podcast and maybe coming alongside through our coaching, through the Maxwell Leadership Certified Coaching and what we're doing through transformation in other countries, coming alongside of what John and now Mark is championing through transformation, through these values and through helping other leaders kind of multiply value to others, coming alongside of that calling and being a part of that. It doesn't have to start with you, right, Mark? Like it doesn't have to originate in your own mind. It can be something that's already happening and and you can join in as a part of it and be a part of, of a legacy, of, of a calling of somebody else, of John Maxwell, of Mark Cole's calling and being a part of that. Yeah, you know, um, I, I for years I told you that I was thirty before I would have given you a purpose statement why why I was placed on this earth. It was forty before I could give you a significant statement. My calling, my calling was availability and proximity to John. Because what happened is, is when I connected with John, it became a multiplier of my purpose and which was to motivate and inspire people. I can motivate and inspire people on my own. And I did for 30 years. 
But when I joined with somebody bigger, better, faster, dreaming more than me, the exponential rate of fulfillment to my purpose statement became a reality. And too many times us leaders put pressure on, I've got to have my own vision statement. I got to have my own purpose statement. I got to have my own calling. And yet most of us, most of us, not some of us, not half of us, most of us was designed to be a team player to somebody else's vision. And that doesn't mean I don't have vision. I have a lot of it. But my vision is fulfilled exponentially by joining somebody with a bigger span and a bigger ability to impact the world around them. And leaders, that doesn't sell me short. That actually sells me long. I have greater influence because somewhere along the way I picked up, I don't have to be the man or the visionary or the leader to be able to have a calling that is bigger than me. So I am excited today to talk about a few things that are very close to my heart and the research and the work that I've been able to do over the years. So I'm gonna be talking about five questions that every resilient leader asks themselves. Now you might ask this of others, but you know, the first, I think, and most important rule of leadership is being able to lead yourself. And so it really has to do with your own personal growth. And we often think about, as leaders, needing to coach others, needing to develop others, which is really important. But we get so much better at leading others when we coach ourselves, when we focus on our own development. And one of the best ways to do that is to ask the kinds of questions that get you the answers, that get you unstuck, that move you forward, and that really stretch you out of your comfort zone. Because, of course, when you stretch, that's when you grow. So how far you are able to go as a leader um, in your relationships, in your finances, in your career, is largely determined by how much you're willing to grow. And so I want to share five questions in particular that I've been talking about a lot lately um, that have gotten a pretty overwhelming response from people. Because, you know, when we ask questions, uh, the assumption is that we have some sort of an answer. Even if it's not the perfect answer, we've got some sort of an answer. So questions tend to engage you. So as I ask these, I want you to answer them for yourself. You might right now answer them in your head. You might later say, hey, this one or two or three questions really spoke to me. And I invite you to take some time to really ponder it. Maybe talk it out with someone else. Maybe in your quiet time, it's talking out with yourself. All right. So the first question really comes from the research in applied positive psychology, which is my background. Um, and a lot of times we think of psychology as fixing problems, fixing the things that are wrong with us. But positive psychology really is the study of what is it that enables things to go right with us? What happens when you perform at your best level? What helps you to be more productive? Um, what is it that causes higher levels of success or even causes you to bond more with people who are more likely than to follow you? And one of the biggest factors is a sense of positive emotion. Positive emotion is not just about feeling good, although that's probably one of the top benefits. But the truth of the matter is that feeling good is actually good for you, all right? So I want you to think for a moment about the things that are really important on your plate right now, your top priorities. Perhaps it's a project that needs to get done. Maybe it's a task that you've been procrastinating about. Um, maybe it's something that you're doing with someone else and it's just kind of become routine. Maybe you, it's kind of drudgery. Maybe it's just something else that is on your to-do list, that long to-do list that sometimes feels overwhelming. And this is the question I want you to ask. How could I add more joy to what I'm doing? How could I add more joy to what I'm doing? Now, you might think this isn't what I'm expecting <laughs> for the first question around resilient leadership, but here's why this is so important. Positive emotion actually expands your ability to deal with adversity and with stress. 
It actually helps you make better decisions. It actually causes you to set higher goals and to persevere towards those goals longer. So when you're dealing with a lot of stress, when you've got a lot on your plate, sometimes what happens is you begin to feel a sense of negative emotion, even for those things that at one point you were excited about doing. Now it's just another thing that needs to get done. Or maybe it's not, you know, it's not going as smoothly as you wanted and there's a lot of challenge in it. And you can begin focusing on the challenge or on the negative over focusing on the parts of it that really bring joy. So when you ask yourself that question, you know, how could I add more joy to it? A lot of times it's the simple things. Um, When I'm working on a book, I have to set the intention that I'm writing with joy. Otherwise, I turn it into this project that's got a deadline and this is stressful and I've got to get this done and oh my goodness, I've got writer's block today. And before you know it, I'm stressed out doing the thing I love most. When I ask how do I infuse this with joy, number one, I remember that's a part of my purpose. And so what I'm doing every single day is what I really want to do. I actually remember that. I may come up with rituals, whether it is lighting a candle, whether it is the music that I'm playing, whether it's the little rewards that I'm getting along the way for reaching certain certain, uh, writing milestones. But for you, this might be a question that you ask of your whole team, right? You're working on a project. How could we make this a bit more fun? Um, You might be practicing for a half marathon, how could you make it more fun, right? It might have to do with something new you're doing in your finances or in your planning. How could you add more joy to it? Sometimes that means involving other people. Sometimes that means making sure that you're celebrating the milestones along the way rather than just racing past them. You actually stop and there's some sort of celebration that you're doing together. And so when you find fun, and sometimes it's about finding fun again, because a lot of the things you're doing now are things that five or 10 years ago you were wishing you could do. You were hoping for that promotion or to move towards building that business. Now you're in it. Don't allow yourself to get so used to getting to a new level of success that you don't tap into your sense of gratitude and joy for it. In fact, scientists have a name for that. It's called the hedonic treadmill. We basically adapt to continually improving circumstances. And so the things that used to make us happy, suddenly we're used to it. It's just the new normal. And so we don't get as much joy from it unless we find ways to notice in the moment what it is that we have to be grateful for, how far we've actually come and the worthiness that there is of celebrating that. So I start there because positive emotion will energize you. It will help you to be more creative. Um, It will help you to renew your energy for your goals. And it simply makes work and life a lot more fun. So how could you add more joy to what you're doing is question number one, because that positive emotion literally makes you stronger. Um, and expands your ability to deal with adversity and stress. So you're automatically more resilient when you've got more positive emotion uh, in your life. Here's question number two. And this is a question to use when you're faced with a situation that might cause you to be less than your best. (laughs) Okay, so maybe it's a difficult conversation that you need to have. Maybe it's a challenge that is really really challenging you. It might be causing you to doubt your own abilities, um, causing you to lose a bit of confidence. Um, Perhaps it is a situation where you haven't figured out the best way to communicate uh, what needs to be communicated. Whenever you are faced with a challenge that could cause you to maybe not step up and be at your best, ask yourself, how do I want to show up? in this situation. How do I want to show up? You know, sometimes there are difficult circumstances that we are at a loss for what to do or how to do it. But when we ask, how do I want to show up? We make that decision. You know, maybe there are layoffs and you're the one that has to deliver the news. 
But the way you want to show up is with compassion and gratitude for the person's service. And perhaps it's with a bit of encouragement for them. Maybe it is a difficult negotiation. And you want to show up with confidence and authenticity. You don't want to back down from what's really important to you. And maybe your core fear is disapproval or rejection. And so when you're in a negotiation, sometimes you don't actually ask for what you want. And so when you ask yourself and you coach yourself with that question, how do I want to show up? You're deciding in advance who you want to be, how you want to be. What is the best version of yourself that you want to show up in that situation? This applies in every area. I mean, even in parenting, which I think is probably our most important leadership role, right? You might have a challenging child in your life, and sometimes they push those buttons, and you're deciding the way that I want to show up is calm and peaceful. I'm deactivating those buttons they like to push, (laughs) and I'm breathing. This is my goal. And so that begins to inform every element of how you respond in the situation. So very simple question. How do you want to show up? If you want to be resilient, you want to be intentional and choose how you want to show up in the situations that matter most. The third question This is one of my favorites, and I know that you know the importance of this because you're listening to this podcast, a John Maxwell podcast, and this is so core to who he is. This is a question that really helped me as I began speaking, Um, you know, as a a public speaker. I often would get nervous uh, before I had to go on stage, and usually it would, you know, it would start like the day before, maybe it would start... Uh, or continue right before I would go on stage, but it was nervousness. And the nervousness really was rooted in a couple of questions. Questions like, um, are they going to like me? Uh, Am I going to be funny, right? I mean, you don't want to be the boring speaker. So you you want people to engage with you. Um, Am I going to remember everything that I'm needing to say? And these questions would come up and I would start to get nervous. Sometimes I would think about the audience because often I've been invited to speak uh, to audiences of just very successful, very impressive people. And so I began saying, I don't, I don't want to show up nervous. This is ridiculous. I know what I'm doing. So the question that really changed everything for me and has coached me ever since, and this is probably... 16, 17 years ago that I first asked myself this question before going on stage. And it's simply this. How are you meant to serve today? How are you meant to serve? There are many situations as a leader where you're called to step up in a big way, a way that might feel intimidating, even though others might not know it because you're the leader, uh, a way that might feel um, anxiety-producing where you might have doubts, where your confidence isn't quite where you want it to be. But here's the thing. If your focus is on how you are meant to serve, the nervousness goes away. Who gets nervous about serving? Because serving is built on the belief that you have value to add to other people, that your path is crossing paths with those people in that moment for a reason. Whether it is a presentation that uh, you need to make or a conversation that you need to have um, or a project that you're working on that you're uniquely equipped to complete. When you focus on how you're meant to make a difference, it's all about how you're going to give, how you're showing up in a way that makes things better for others. And when that's your focus, What happens is you take the focus off of you and what everyone's going to think about you and you put the focus onto them and how you're intending to make life better in some way for them. Whether that is for the team members that you lead, whether that is in your own family, whether that is you standing on a stage. When you ask, how am I meant to serve, you get back to the core of why you're doing what you're doing. 
Even if you've never said to yourself, oh, my purpose is, and you fill in the blank because you're clear about what it is, even if you've never done that before, here's the thing. Your purpose is always about how you're serving others, how you're making an impact, how you're making a difference. And so tapping into that really just relieves you of all of that pressure and the weight of what everyone else is going to think, even if, even if those thoughts are on, oh, I'm going to be embarrassed. Oh, I'm not going to do it right. It's okay. The bigger question is, did you serve in the way you were meant to serve? So I'm wondering where you need to be asking that question. How are you meant to serve? How are you meant to serve your community? How are you meant to serve in the organization that you work for? Even if you're the one running the organization, how are you meant to serve in your own family? Keep a focus on that, and that's where your strength will be. Now, I've got two more questions I want you to coach yourself with. The first one sounds so simple. It's probably one of the simplest questions to coach yourself with, and it has a lot of application in different scenarios. I like to apply it, particularly when someone is tempted to complain or overfocus on what's going wrong. Now, as leaders, we have to pay attention to things that aren't working because oftentimes we need to fix things, right? We need to come up with new systems or kind of diagnose a problem so that we can um, clear the way, right? To be resilient as an organization or as a person, we've got to clear some of those blocks. But sometimes we can overfocus on what's wrong. We can overfocus on weaknesses. Um, we can get into a situation where all we're talking about is the problem, which is really what we don't want, right? We can start talking to everybody else about it. We can start complaining about it. When you find yourself talking too much about the things you don't want, stop yourself and ask, what do you want? I'm wondering what the situation is that's presenting itself to you right now where you've been talking too much about what you don't want, whether it is the uh, team member that's not stepping up the way they need to, whether it is the career that you no longer like, or maybe you never liked it in the first place. <laughs> you did it for other reasons because it was expected of you, etc. Whether it is the fact that you really would like to do something entrepreneurial because you don't like where you are, whether it's something very personal, like maybe you don't like your weight, you don't like your health habits, and it can be easy to overfocus on what you don't like, what you don't do well, what someone else isn't doing well. The bigger question is, what do you want? The research shows that when we're coaching, and coaching is really helping someone move from where they are to where they really want to be, and to be able to navigate the obstacles and the challenges and even the opportunities that appear along the way. And so one of the things that we know from research is that when we can help a person focus on their vision, it immediately moves them from a place that feels negative emotionally to a place that feels positive. It actually is where the inspiration comes from. Suddenly in coaching sessions, you'll notice a lightness in the person's voice. When they've hooked people up to brain scans while they are being coached and they ask questions that cause them to think about their vision, it actually changes the brain chemistry, what's actually happening in your brain. So when you're over-focused on the stuff that's going wrong and you don't stop and say, well, what do I want? You end up making it much more difficult to bounce back from those negatives. At some point, you have to stop with the negatives and say, okay, what do I want? Sometimes that's what do I want instead. In other words, what's the solution? What's the vision? If you're having trouble over and over again with one team member, or maybe it's a collective number of team members, maybe it's a leadership issue. And if you get honest about that, what do I want? Hmm, I want a team that operates cohesively, where everybody's moving towards this common vision and they're energized by it, where everyone's working within their own strengths. Now you're painting a clear vision of where you want to go. Now, there might be a lot of steps to getting there, but 
when you ask that question, you now realize the real problem that needs to be solved, some changes that need to be made. And there's no need to be intimidated by it. If you're honest about it, you begin to understand the answers. And it may start with simple steps. It may start with retraining. It may start with you getting clarity of vision so you can share it and then you can operate by it, right? So what do you want stops you in your tracks from talking too much about what you don't want. You need to understand what you don't want, but at some point you need to pivot. (laughs) You need to say, okay, so this is what happened. What am I learning from it? And how will I move forward? All right. This final question that I want you to coach yourself with, and I think is absolutely critical for resilient leaders comes from a book uh, I wrote called It's About Time, The Art of Choosing the Meaningful Over the Urgent. The question applies when we're trying to make a decision about how to spend our time. And these are decisions we make every single day. In fact, we're often making micro decisions, right? You might have made micro decisions in the last five or 10 minutes, You know, your phone might have been (laughs) dinging and you had a text and you needed to pay attention, but somehow you, you know, you got distracted. And so you were multitasking and there you go again. Maybe you rewound, (laughs) right, the podcast because you weren't really listening. We make those micro decisions all the time because we're constantly distracted, but we also make even bigger ones. And so what you need to ask yourself is very simple. It's this. Is this meaningful or is it urgent? And when I say urgent, what I'm referring to is what I like to call false urgencies. We have a lot of them today. Things that feel urgent because we got them right there in the moment. But in the long range scheme of things, they're not urgent at all. It is you turning on the TV and seeing breaking news, but the breaking news is a celebrity couple that had a baby, and you don't even know who the celebrities are, (laughs) but you've stopped what you're doing to perhaps uh, not pay attention in that conversation with a loved one because, oh, there's breaking news. It's the texts. It's the scrolling on social media. It's the person who wants you to do something that makes sense for them right now, but doesn't really make sense for you. But Maybe you feel like I have to say yes because you you fear telling people no. You're addicted to approval, right? But if you stop and you say, is this meaningful or is it a false urgency? You'll pause, you'll take a breath, and you'll be able to say, hmm, meaningful? If it's meaningful, you'll be glad a month from now you did it, a year from now even 20 years from now, in that moment when your child needed your attention, your spouse or your partner needed your attention, when you decided to put away all the distractions and finally focus on building that business that you wanted to build or going back to school because you know it's going to bring you closer to a career goal, when you realized yeah, I'm going to make the meaningful choice in eating something a little healthier because I've decided that it's not negotiable anymore. I need to take good care of myself. When you pause and ask, is this meaningful or is it a false urgency? You always get the right answer. And like I said, I often will ask, gosh, is it meaningful? Is it meaningful a month from now? Is it meaningful a year from now? Okay, then that's the right answer. And since we are often bombarded with so many decisions to make, this becomes even more important to ask of yourself. A very, very simple coaching question. So that's it. Five questions every resilient leader asks themselves. And ask these of yourself, but keep them in your back pocket because a great leader coaches others. (laughs) And so these are great questions that you might even ask those you're developing. How could you add more joy to what you're doing? How do you want to show up in the situation? How are you meant to serve today? What do you want? And is it meaningful or is it just urgent? 
So I cannot wait to talk about these with you, Mark, uh, because these are, this is what I do. I love coaching, um, but I love coaching through questions. Welcome to the Maxwell Leadership Executive Podcast, where our goal is to help you increase your reputation as a leader, increase your ability to influence others, and increase your ability to fully engage your team to deliver remarkable results. 